please rise. Welcome in the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world. We are gathered to worship, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, to remember before God our sister Catherine Griffith, to give thanks for her life, to commend her to our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in our grief. Please join in our entrance hymn, Shall We Gather at the River? It can be found in your red hymnals, number 420. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us from the dust of the earth by your breath, gave us life, we glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise you. Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our confidence and everlasting hope, we worship you. To you, O blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. And we will hear now from Sue Jacobson as she gives some greetings from the family. Hi, my name is Sue, and I'm Kathy's oldest daughter. And if you haven't had the chance to check out some pictures of a younger Kathy, do so outside. She was beautiful, and she had a bright smile. And she also had a pretty shirt on today, and I have one of the same thing, because when I saw something nice, I bought one for me and one for her. But I was afraid to wear it, because I didn't want anyone to think maybe I'd robbed a casket and that she was naked in there, and she is wearing that shirt. So let me tell you a little bit about Kathy, things you might not know. She was the youngest of nine children born to Greek immigrants. She lived in a house that had three bedrooms and one bathroom. Think of that, 11 people. The Greeks knew her only by the name of Poppy. If you asked if they knew Catherine Belvis, they didn't know who she was. Rumor has it, when she was a small child, she listened to a song called Amapola, My Pretty Little Poppy, and it was a popular song back then, and the actress that sang it actually looked like mom. She liked it and said, that's me, that's me. And for thereafter, she was known by Poppy. So mom graduated from Washington High School at the age of 16. She was moved forward a couple years. She bore four children and buried her only son by the time she was 25. Think of that. My mother was the first person to show me what unconditional love was, the love that our father shows for us. Mom was a wife and a stay-at-home mom until she came to work about 1975, and she was the financial secretary here at Eastside Lutheran. This became her family. And she used her earnings to indulge in her hobbies. She bought four sewing machines, four, and lots of fabric. Mom loved to quilt. When mom's sister Bea's grandson got cancer, she, she quilted him a puppy quilt. And then she built, she quilted dozens of others for the cancer kids at Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York City. She also probably sewed together hundreds of quilt tops for the church, and they were brought to the church quilted and sent on for Lutheran relief. And it's a coincidence that a lot of these quilts are here today because they were here Sunday for the blessing before they're sent on. And though mom didn't quilt any of these or sew them together, a lot of the fabric is hers because she donated a lot when she moved to Stony Brook Suites in 2016. So mom loved to quilt. So. And mom was living in what Max Lucado would call her sweet spot when she quilted. And Max Lucado's definition of a sweet spot is doing something that you like, doing something that you're good at, and when you do it to glorify God, where they intersect, that's your sweet spot. So, and she was living in her sweet spot. Mom also loved to china paint. She had two kilns. She never had just one of anything. So, and she was also president of the China Painters Association in Sioux Falls from 1985 to 1987. And she served as a chairman for their convention. And for those of you afraid to leave anything for your kids when you die because you don't want to have to have them go through it, don't worry about it because they're going to learn a lot from you. And I saw a lot of wonderful pictures of my mom with her china painting friends. And they were all holding glasses of wine in one. And they had big smiles on their face. <laughs> and I never saw my mom with wine. She was more of a, her beverage of choice was Diet Coke. So, but look at those pictures. It just brought back memories, and I saw that bright smile. Mom and Dad also had a cabin up at Big Stone Lake, and I think that's why she had multiples, because she could have a sewing machine and quilt there and indulge in activities when she wasn't fishing or watching Minnesota Twins baseball. Mom's favorite time was playing cards with friends. They played bridge and something called hand and foot. So towards the end, you know, her competitive spirit took priority of the companionship that card playing provided for her, and she wanted to win at any cost. 
What we didn't recognize for quite some time was that mom had Alzheimer's dementia. We did know that she was handicapped with physical ailments by the time she was 50 and was buried with several knee replacements and both hip replacements. And she had a lot of arthritis, so she was in a lot of pain, but it didn't stop her from going on a trip to Norway six weeks after a total knee surgery. Can you believe that? Mom never really fully recovered from the death of my dad. He died of ALS in 2010. She had a series of falls that had actually started before that time. But in 2015, she took one that she broke her hip and she had a hip replacement, a stay in a rehab. And we were sent for a neuropsych test at that time. And that's when we first heard the words, all my Alzheimer's dementia. And we never told her that because she suffered from anxiety and we didn't want her to live in anxiety, but to live her life. And after my dad, my sister died in 2016, my mom agreed to go to Stony Brook assisted living with her four sewing machines, mind you. And she gave up her car at that time, which was a good thing because she'd been in a series of car accidents and they involved parked cars, fire hydrants, and one even resulted in a warrant for her arrest. But otherwise her criminal history was free and mom can smile about it now, but it wasn't a laughing matter at the time because lose your car, it sort of signals the end of your independence and that was a hard thing for her to do. She moved to Dal Rummel, the assisted living in 2019, October, and then the pandemic hit. Mom became weak and in June of 2020, she was found on the floor and she had pneumonia and she went to the hospital and then she was moved to the nursing home. So in the last, what would be the last year of her life, she was isolated from the family that she loved. But one nice thing about the pandemic is that our church services are recorded. And I could bring my iPad in and we could listen to the church service. She could say the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and she could hear me play in the handbell choir. So yes, I am a dingling. So. But mom still missed her family, and she tried to escape many times. And they had to call and file like something with the Department of Health every time she did this. But she wanted to see her family. That's what she was trying to get to. She wanted to see her family. In the past year, mom couldn't remember how to use a telephone. So the kind staff at Dow Rummel would call our number because she wanted to talk to us. She really missed seeing the great-grandchildren. All six of them are here, including one that she never had the opportunity to meet. They called her Yaya, which is Greek for grandma, and when they called her that, her smile was big and it was bright. Gunnar and Riker, I had the chance to bring them several months ago to play cards with Yaya, and the only card game I could find, it, because I didn't wait too long, was Old Maid. And dang, if she didn't try and hold that old maid, hide that old maid card. So, but she ended up happily losing several games because she was so happy to see them. And that day, her smile was big and it was very bright. Alzheimer's dementia is not a pretty disease and it wasn't always easy to be around mom. We knew that when we visited her, she would not remember our visits. We could only create happy moments during that visit. And though she might not remember, that happy feeling, that feel-good feeling would stick with her and she would be happy, but not really remember why, but it gave her peace. During the pandemic, the staff at Dal Rommel became her family and they liked her. Even when she was cussing them out in Greek, they were kind to her and one even called her Grandma Kathy. She retained her sense of humor. One day the harried social worker was walking by her on her way to a meeting and realized she'd forgotten something and says, oh my mind, what is happening to my mind? And Kathy said, you better watch out what you see in a place like this. So <laughs> there was a lot of Alzheimer's patients there. And she was always watching out for others. And even the day before she died, she was concerned that someone needed help and she reached out to a staff member. Four weeks ago, mom fell and broke her hip. It was a traumatic break that required surgery and she became quite confused in the aftermath. 
and would lo loudly call out. It was repetitive, the same thing, and there wasn't any way we could comfort her. One afternoon in desperation, I just started singing, Jesus loves me, and she sang with me. And then I sang, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and that calmed her down. Nine days before mom died, I walked into mom's room, and a young lady by the name of Alex was sitting by mom, holding her hand, and she was saying comforting words. I had never seen Alex before, but her words were sincere, they were genuine. I walked in and I witnessed Alex showing God's grace and kindness to my mother. And what more can we ask than that? So Alex was saying that if mom was calling out in pain, you know, or she was the reason why she was calling out, it was either pain or she was very fearful. They basically became her family. They were the ones that saw her every morning, noon, night. Mom took three more calls in the week before she died, and she would try and crawl out of bed, and they found her on the floor. The staff would ask, Kathy, why are you trying to get out of bed? And her reply was, every single time, to see my children. My children need help. So they need me, I need to see them. She had also verbalized to me three different times in the past month that she was ready to go home, that she was ready to go to heaven. So mom died on Monday, November 15th, and I had just worked 70 hours at graveyards and gotten off work that morning. And I was in just total despair because I'd received a call on the way into work that mom had taken yet another fall. And I didn't know what to do. You know, I didn't know how to help her. And I just got down on the floor face down and I cried and I prayed like I've never prayed before for ways to help mom and then realized this is not in my control, this is in God's control. And I professed my faith in God and, you know, even told him the whole story even though he already knew every word, you know, and then said she was ready to go to heaven and if it was his will, please take her. She was, she was ready to be young again. And my husband woke me hours away to say that she had passed. So, you know, when she said she wanted to go to heaven, she said she wanted to take some of her pictures to heaven with her. And last night at the visitation, my youngest, my second to the youngest great, or granddaughter, mom's great granddaughter, Eliza, was staring at Yaya. And she didn't want to leave. She'd written a little card for Yaya, and she wanted to give it to her. And she would not leave her side last night until she put this little note inside her casket. And it was, I love you, Yaya. So I'm sure mom is very happy about that. So all I can say to end this is, Mother, I rejoice in the fact that you're with our Heavenly Father in heaven. You are young again. You are free again. You are pain free. And your smile shines bright. And we will see you again. Love you, Mom. Sue, that was one of the most beautiful eulogies. Thank you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our sister Catherine. We thank you for giving her to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we may live in confidence and hope until, by your call, we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We read now some scriptures selected here by the family. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of my Lord my whole life long. And from the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. And now we hear, in the garden, sung by John Sorrow.
Our gospel reading for this morning comes to us from the book of John, the 14th chapter. Words of Jesus speaking to his disciples before he is ready to make departure from them. Jesus speaks, I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave to you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. Sue, Julie, family, and Friends, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, grace and peace to each and every one of you. In the name of God, our Father, and of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. I want to say thank you again, Sue, for those wonderful words that you shared of your mother, heartfelt words. But I must admit that in, in all of my interactions with your mother, I never thought of her as an outlaw being chased down by the police. It's a cute image today. Not so much then, I'm sure, but, but wonderful. I can remember the, the first time I, I did visit with Kathy. I had a, a chance to meet with her when she was at, at Stony Brook, and somewhere um, the timing of the visit must not have been communicated exactly right, so I, I came in right when she was in the middle of one of her card games with one of her friends. And even though she had not had a chance to really meet me before, she welcomed me simply because I came as a representative of, of her church. But in all of the conversation that we had, the, the wonderful conversation, the cards didn't stop once. They just kept being dealt right out the whole time. But it was just delightful to, to have that opportunity to, to visit. The visit was great that day, and, and so were her card buddies. You could see that there was a bond formed around that table with them. And, and she smiled, and you mentioned her smile the entire time. Sometime later, I had a chance to, to visit with her again, this time at a, at a different location where she was at in her, her room. And I'm not sure how well she remembered me, but she was so happy to see me again because I was a representative of her church, of East Side Lutheran. And she so graciously welcomed me. It's been a, a long time visiting. Happy to hear the news and the updates that I could share of things that were going on in her congregation. And we sat together and read scripture and had bread and wine as we celebrated Holy Communion with one another. Kathy loved her church. She was married in the chapel just right over here, confirmed here as an adult, involved with so many of the church's ministries and, and organizations, and even served for a time as the financial secretary of the congregation in the mid-70s. I'm very grateful for those two first two visits I had with Kathy. I felt honored to be welcomed by her and, and into her presence and even if I was a little interruption to her card game. She loved cards, didn't like to lose, but she loved cards, but what I think she also really loved was the people with whom she was playing with, those card buddies who were such a support for her. Fun to hear of her love of the twins, we had that in common with one another. She loved to craft, and it was so interesting when you were sharing with me that 
who served as president of the China Painters. That was an organization I was unaware of until now, but it's just fascinating to me, and, and even more so the fact that she had not one, but two kilns of her own that she could use in that process. She loved to sew, as people know quite well. I think, from the way it was described, it was more of an obsession, really. And Sue and, and, and Julie shared with me that at one point in her life, there was a quilt shop that was closing, and so she practically cleared out the whole place, buying all kinds of material. But there was a benefit to that, because as mentioned, many of the quilts that are now on the back of the pews of where you are at were a piece of that. And so are the untold numbers of people who will experience love and warmth and the fact that somebody cares about them through these quilts that have been made. The untold impact that sometimes our lives have that we never fully know. Certainly the fact in this case. And, and I've been calling it divine coincidence that we are here on this day at the same time that the quilts of the East Side Lutheran Mission quilters are on these pews and that her fabric was a part of them. Because there is a, is a, a comfort, yes, in a quilt, but, but more than that, there is a love in a quilt. As we wrap ourselves in that, we can see ourselves being wrapped in the love of God shown to us through other and regardless of the, the circumstances and the ups and downs that we might face in life, the love that comes through the gifts and generosity through acts of kindness that we can give changes lives. Jesus Christ works through us in that process, and I'm confident Christ was at work in Kathy through all of the work that she did in that way. She mentioned her unconditional love for her family. Being a part of families, any families, can be difficult at times. I think we all know that, and we joke about it at Thanksgiving time, because families can be messy, all of them, even in the best of times. But through it all, Kathy loved. She loved. And that love was extended to others, even though at times it was hard for her to show that. In these later years, as her Alzheimer's degree, or the disease progressed, she kind of was pushed away from others and others from her. It's a nasty disease. It creates barriers. It takes a great toll on the person who's going through it, but, but even also it takes a great toll on those who are caregivers for someone with that disease. In 2020, it was estimated that 11 million family members and unpaid caregivers gave 15.3 billion hours of care to people with Alzheimer's and other dementias, valued at $257 billion worth of unpaid care. But the real cost is the emotional health all of those who are in that caregiving role and what it takes on them. Perhaps many of us can experience that firsthand. My last visit that I had with Kathy was when she was in the hospital here after her, her last fall. And when we were there, we had a chance to again share scripture with one another. We read Psalm 23, those words that are familiar, ingrained somewhere deep in us that bring us a sense of but more than that, they are a reminder to us of God's presence with us, of God's promise to be with us, and of the assurance that we have of Christ's love and life with him in eternity. But Julie and Sue and I were talking just the other day. Sue shared with me of yet one more scripture passage that surfaced in these last days. And it was that passage that speaks to us of Peter who was in the boat and who sees Jesus out walking on the waters in the midst of a storm. And Jesus summons Peter to come to him and Peter gets out of the boat in an act of faith and starts to walk 
on the water toward Jesus, but seeing the storm raging around him begins to sink. Until Jesus reaches out to Peter. And it is as if Jesus is saying, keep your eyes on me and not the storm. Keep your eyes on me and not the storm. And you will get through this. Powerful passage. Powerful that it surfaces at a time like this. For Kathy and, and perhaps all of us know the ups and downs of life. The storms, if you will, that, that rage around us, that take on many different names. But in the midst of it, Kathy was able to keep Jesus in her sight. And that is my prayer for each one of us as we gather here with one another today and as we share stories, as, as, as we express our, our fears as well as our joys, that we keep Jesus in our sight. For in him there is forgiveness of sins, welcome, and the promise of peace. Whatever we might have done or said in the past, Christ is there to offer us peace. Forgiveness and welcome and peace. And so I close this morning with these words of Jesus that we heard just a moment ago from this 14th chapter of John. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives, so do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them. I think it's only appropriate, seeing how these pews are still adorned by these quilts, that we take a moment and pray for those who will be receiving this act of love that is sown into them. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for the love that we have experienced in our life. And we give you thanks for the promise that you are with us even as we grieve. May we keep our eyes on Jesus through all that we face. We pray that these quilts that are now behind our backs might go out from this place and the love that has been sown into them might be experienced by countless others all throughout the world. May our love and all that we do in this life be grounded in your love for us that other people might be blessed and that we might trust you in the process. Amen. Thanks be to God for the life of Catherine Griffin and for her faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. I was the
For our prayers today, I'll end each petition with the phrase, Lord, in your mercy, and our response together will be, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, in holy baptism you have knit your chosen people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to share the new life in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage and faith to all who mourn and assure in certain hope of your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your light and your life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We sing together on our way rejoicing, number 537 in our red hymn. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Catherine, 
Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in peace, in the name of Christ.